Good morning and welcome to the Dot Baptist Church. We're glad you could join by video. We love that you can be with us each and every week. We'd love for you to come and be with us in person. We meet every Sunday at 10 o'clock. Except the next two Sundays now, we won't be having Sunday school. We'll be having church only because we've got Christmas Eve and New Year's. But starting in January, we'll be back on track with our lessons every week at 10 o'clock. So before we go into our lesson, though, we have uh, Walter Smith and, and Brenda will come and, and bless her heart. Walter, where you at? I'm oh, oh, right behind us. All right, Walter, bless us in music and song, and then Brenda will come and sing for us. All right, Walter, let's have it. Good morning. Everybody looks Christmassy. That's good. Anyway, uh, at work we have this lady, and she's an all-knowing lady. She's a, like an encyclopedia. She can tell you anything you want to know and things you don't know and don't want to know. <laughs> but anyway, uh, she observed me, and she looked at me and said, Walter, I've looked at you, and I want to tell you something. Said there is no Santa Claus, and when she told me that, it broke my heart and run me for the rest of the day. But uh, in our minds, I think we might have a Santa Claus. So Virginia said, "Yes, Virginia, there's a Santa Claus." Say again. The movie they had of uh, said, "Yes, Virginia, there's a Santa Claus." It broke the letter. All right. Away in the manger. Away in the manger. This is a song that was popular in a campaign in Gulfport, Mississippi at the CB base with a handful of Marines. And it was about Tots for Toys. Marines, they have a program every year, Tots for Toys for underprivileged children that get toys to the Marine Corps. And Anyway, with the CBs, that's the Navy, and we had a handful of Marines, and we helped them with their program, Toys for Tots. And uh, this song was prevalent then. But we need to help little children that don't have anything for Christmas. It's very important that little orphan children get something for Christmas. And uh, if you see a Marine recruiter, tell them, they're doing a good job, and you want to help them uh, win these toys for tots. Will send a car to Shanty Town to a poor little boy like me. Will he bring me some toys like the other girls and boys? Will send a sees our Christmas tree. Mommy says he would if I promised to be good. Oh, we don't have a fireplace or a chimney on our shack like the other lucky boys and girls who live across the track. But if I say my prayers each night when Christmas rolls around, will Santa come to Shanty Town? He didn't come last Christmas, doesn't he know we live here? Will my 
mommy have to paint my toys the way she did last year. But if I say my prayers each night when Christmas rolls around, will Santa come to Shanty Town? Will Santa come to Shanty Town? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you deliver will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will give sight to a blind man? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would calm a storm with his hand? Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? And when you kiss your little baby, you've kissed the face of God. Oh, Mary, did you know? Oh, Mary, did you know? The blind will see, the deaf will hear, the dead will live again. The lame will leap, the dumb will speak, the praises of the Lamb. Mary, did you know that your baby boy is Lord of all creation? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will one day rule the nations? Did you know that your baby boy was heaven's perfect lamb and the sleeping child you're holding is the great I am oh Mary did you know and Brenda. It's a beautiful song, Mary, did you know? It's... Our lesson today is love in place of fear. It's me and First John. You know, ask the question here. What gives you a strong sense of contentment? But I want to change that and ask you, <clears throat> does anybody want to share one of your most memorable Christmases? Nobody, nobody has a memorable Christmas. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> okay, thanks for sharing with me. Anybody else got a memorable Christmas? <clears throat> Well, what, are you, what are you thinking? Let me share this with you. 
when I grew up at Christmas time, <clears throat> we didn't get a dozen toys. You got one, <laughs> you know, a little sack of, uh, we had the nuts and orange, apples, something like that, and a uh, little candy, and your gift, that was it. And I remember one year, man, I, my, my favorite hero, and I still got some of his stuff, was Hopalong Cassidy. Some of y'all probably don't know that, I guess. Did you ever, yeah. any of y'all remember Hopalong Cassidy? Yeah. yeah. When everybody else was going after Roy Rogers, Gene Alter, and all those people, I was a Hopalong Cassidy fan. And I got some pictures when I was a little boy. With my, I had a complete outfit, man. It wasn't nothing. I had the little steer and a bandana and the hat and the crease and the belt, all, all the, whole, the boots. I had the whole works. I thought I was something. I got several pictures. I even got one of the mugs, happy mug and stuff. And I was so thrilled that year because I finally, I was wishing I could get it, and I got up, and there it was. Now, have you ever, you ever was you, that way as a kid, is something particularly wanted? Now, when I got my bicycle years later, I thought that was nice, but I was more appreciative when I got my little half long Cassidy outfit, because that was uh, something for me. Do you still have that? I don't, I, I don't have the outfit because I couldn't get my leg in it now, but, but, but I do have my mug and the picture of me in it. So, anyway, uh, some, some things we flash back, I guess, to our childhood memory, maybe sometime adults. Anybody else got want to share one? Yeah. 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 That was that was a good that was a good gift, wasn't it? Others? Yes. Uh, my best friend uh, proposed to me on Christmas Eve. Proposed to you? That's a memorable Christmas, then, wasn't it? Okay, some others? I think it's important. Y'all share some with us. I, mean, I know we got a lesson to do, and I'll try to summarize it in a minute, but I want to hear some things from y'all if we can. Christmas. You might get your wish this year, I'm not sure. I hope not. Anybody else? All right, well, I know those are, those are a joy to hear, and I'm sure a lot of y'all have them, and some people may be afraid to speak out and say what they have, but, but it's, it's good that you open up and share some things with us sometimes. It's a, it's a meaningful event. But when we look at our lesson today, we're talking about love in place of fear. And we see as a child sometimes likes to be known that his parents are with him and actually backing him up and there. But we know that God is there all the time to back us up. A teacher sometimes makes us feel good when we think we're excelling in something. Or anybody ever play sports, football, or anything? It makes you feel good when the crowd is cheering for you, doesn't it? When you hear them yelling out out there, you get all excited and ready to go. We were just talking about the other day when Gainesville was playing. I said, I mean, I said, you know, there was something back in our day. We had the red jackets and gray pants, and the big trailway bus came right after school. We hopped on it, and away you went. <clears throat> it was an exciting time. So, so was, but, but anyway, those, those are memorable things that we probably won't forget. Was it, Lois, you got the first verses? Yes. Do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers and sisters. The one who does not love remains in death. Everyone who hates his brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we have come to know love. He laid down his life for us. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. 
If anyone has this world's goods and sees a fellow believer in need but withholds compassion from him, how does God's love reside in him? Little children, let us not love in word or speech, but in action and in truth. I notice why he starts off here. And if you go back to the verses in chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, he addresses the people as little children. He says, but do not sin and do what is right. And that was, that was verses prior to that. Now he picks up in, in the chapter, thir- I mean, verse 13, and he says, do not be surprised that the world will hate you. Now, it hated Christ when he came, and we're no different if we are following him, that the world is going to hate you. And so we look at it, he's talking now to not as little children, he calls them brothers and sisters. About the only time you're going to hear him say that in this text here, but he calls them his brothers and sisters, meaning meaning generically male and female. He's not just talking about men, he's talking about both when he says that. He says, look at the world today through evilness, how Satan is really running rapid through the world today that's creating all kind of havoc in our world. He said, but they experience, actually these people, they experience pagan religions and political people who are making it difficult for them. He's looking at the distress there. Those who are still living in, living in sin, following the devil, he says, you're dead under Christ. Once you come to Christ, he said, now you've passed from death to life. You have life now that you've accepted Christ because he's in you and you're in him. So he put it there. Everyone who hates you, his brothers and sisters, is a murderer. Now, he goes on. I want to clarify this so people understand. He says they have no eternal life. Now, what he's saying is those who have not repented. There is hope for them if they come through repentance and reconciliation with Christ. Then they can still go to heaven. Get that in mind. I know people think, well, they done this. They're not going. Yeah, they can, but they, it's going to require repentance. See, if you're unrepentant, you're not going to make it anyways. But and he's saying that. But he look at how he phrases. If you hate your brother, he put it on equal terms of murder. If you hate your brother, even though your thoughts could carry you so further to do the deed, he said it's still the same like the murderer. You've destroyed your, in your mind that person because your hatred is so bad that you would like to follow through with your deed of murder. And so he talks about here very specifically. So the motives would be the same. He said, no murder has eternal life residing in him, but he didn't close the door here, what I told you, but further repentance and forgiveness and reconciliation. That's the only thing that saves all of us. We're all dead into sins it doesn't matter what we've done all sin is sin but we have to come openly before christ asking for forgiveness accepting christ as our savior so that we can be forgiven for our past present and future sins and so he goes on to talk about the turn here he said christ laid down his life for us he goes on to say and we shall do that but but it goes on to say who among you will lay down his life for another he didn't literally mean we have to do that. We can't lay our life and forgive somebody's sins. You're probably not going to lay down your life for somebody, and that's what he goes on to talk about. But he did talk about three wonderful things here. First of all, he talks about three th- faces of love. Phileo. He's talking about in the New Testament. brother love or friendship love. Aros, which is erotic love, sexual love. But you don't find that mentioned in the New Testament. But you do find this, agape love, and that's the love that Christ gave us, unconditional love for us. Listen, we don't deserve the love that God gives us. We don't deserve what God is offering us. But because of his love, and John makes this clear in his, in his message, because John had five different books there, 1 John 1, 2, 3, and Revelation in the book of John. He makes it clear in this, these books of 1, 2, and 3, of love. That's his main theme there because John was said he was the disciples that loved Jesus, that Jesus loved him. And that's why he emphasizes the love in his chapter. Now, wouldn't it be nice if the whole world had love? When you see the evilness today, wouldn't it be nice if those people had love in their heart instead of violence? It'd be nice, wouldn't it? But unfortunately, it don't happen that way. But John talks about that. That we lay down our lives for our brother. 
And you know what Benigni goes on? Knowing it, knowing now. He's wise enough to know that most readers aren't likely to lay down their life for someone else. But he proposes something different. Listen very carefully. Those who have the world's goods, those who are economically well off in church, if you see a brother or sister in need, what does he say? You should help supply that need. Come to their rescue. Whoa! He said, if you don't, you've closed the door and turned your back on that. So he said, we have that obligation then if we're doing well. If we're doing well, we have the world's goods, wealth, doing better economically than some of our brothers and sisters. If something happens to them that they're in need, he's saying we should come to their rescue. I think that's pretty well what he's summing up, isn't it? I think he even talked about that later or earlier in, as far as the widows and orphans, how they should be taken care of. So what did he really mean by what he's saying here? He says it's with a strong challenge is what he's actually doing. My little children affectionately calls them. He said, don't just talk about love and words. See, it's easy. To, oh, it's easy to say I love you. You hear that a lot, don't you? It gets so misused and repetitious that sometimes it loses meaning. And the reason I'm saying that is love is an action word. It's not just verbally, but it's how you show yourself in love. And that's what he's talking about here. Action. Proving it. Over and over. You see, you can't. I'm not knocking people just said, I love you, and I'm sure they mean it. And you see a guy tells this girl, oh, I love you, but does he really? <laughs> you know, I think I shared with you before, you got a guy there's on a date, and he's telling this girl how much he loves her. Later, they're eating burgers and hot dogs, and he's a boy, I sure do love these things. Boy, she loves the hot dog or her. You, know? you see, we misuse that. And what he wants to do is show that. And I'm going to share this with you, and I think I've shared it before. My mother and dad didn't get to celebrate their 50th anniversary, my dad passed away. All my life, and I'm sure in their private time, they probably said something. I never heard my mother and dad tell each other they loved them. But listen to me real careful. They didn't have to because you could see it in their life and actions to each other. That's what love is, is action. Not just saying it, but doing it. And that's what we saw. I'm sure in their private time, they probably spouted the words. I don't know. I wasn't there to hear that. But, but, but their life... They reflected how much they really loved each other. And I think that's what he's telling us. Do you love your fellow brothers and sisters? He's telling us we should. Now listen. I think I've told you all this a lot of times. Get as used to me and love me here because you're going to have eternity with me and I don't want you to punish. <laughs> Got me? So let's love each other. That's what he's saying. Brothers and sisters should love each other and generally care for one another. But let me tell you what. And sometimes you see this, and God forbid it happened, but you see it. Even among Christian people, sometimes you see backstabbers and backbiters and condemning individuals that will rip you apart like a lion coming after you. And he said, be careful. That's not what I want you to do. He goes on to talk about that. The apostle said, look at the similar assertion here. If you do not, in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul said, even if I speak with human or angelic tongues, but do not have love, listen, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. In other words, you make a lot of noise, but it don't amount to anything. Well, what he's saying, but you should have love. Read verses 2 real quick, George. i got about five, six, seven minutes to get all this through. Or we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent His Son as the world's Savior. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in Him and He in God. And we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And the one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in him.
look what he's saying to us. He's talking about our primary belief here, and he began to emphasize that to us as a position. But he also said, because you've been saved, all the apostles stuff were eyewitnesses to Christ himself. But listen, once you accept Christ as your Savior, then you can testify to what Christ has done for you. Follow me? It's like they were eyewitnesses, but we can give witness to what Christ has done for us. We might not have saw him personally as they did, but we can witness to what he has done in our life. And that's what he's saying. Whosoever confesses Jesus to be the Son, salvation process happens. In response to it, he said, The Father, the first person of the Trinity, sent his Son, the second person of the Trinity, into a world to die on a cross for us. Listen, that takes a lot of love. Once we accept Christ, the third person of the Trinity comes to reside in us for a lifetime. Follow me? That's the Holy Spirit. You receive then. And what he wants us to look at here is how the salvation comes. He said, God remains in him and he in God. He says, and we, to know and believe and to love, God has for us. And then he talks about the events in our life has a war. Uh, heartwarming experience of God's love in one's life. Do you have that love of God in your heart? Do you love your fellow man? Now listen, we're talking about love. We're not talking about a sexual romantic love. We're talking about a love of the person, a brotherly love or sisterly love, a relationship there like in a friendship situation. You see, when we gather as a group, we're to uplift each other up and hold each other up and genuinely care and love for one another. I think I've told you all that time, I love everybody in the class. There's not a soul in here that I don't love. Now there's a few who have to talk with us. I was just joking. But when we see it and can feel it, I think I told you all at the party, one thing that admires me about this class it's when we come together with different personalities and different backgrounds. We come together and there's a genuine bond among us. The care that you have for each other, that's amazing. I'm so thrilled with that and I'm glad to see it. It does my heart good to walk in here on Sunday morning to see all y'all. I get uplifted and inspired, inspired by it. Sometimes I guess y'all can see it when it, I get rubbed up sometimes. I don't mean to scare anybody, but he said, look at the grammar that we use. Are we just saying things to be saying, or do we mean them? He says, if you come and just verbally say, I've been saved, go through baptism, and it's not real, then you're just as lost as you were before. But it has to be real that you actually sincerely come before Christ in your heart, openly and meaningly accept Him as your Savior. Christ didn't come just on the flippant. He come prepared for that purpose to give us that opportunity. Whether we accept it or not, it's another choice. How many people just turn their back and walk away? And that's what basically he's looking at here. <laughs> what is that? Look, love is God. No, it's not. God is love. You see, some people want to turn it around. God is the person. Love is the attribute. But God is love. So when we look at what he's trying to tell us is, how much do you love? How much do you care? What's the consequences? How do you express it? Do you look at it as Christ looked at people or dependent on emotions? He said, look, emotions will go high and low. Experiences can come and go. But he says, it needs to be real. Not some make-believe fake stuff. Read the third verses there, Howard. Notice what he's talking about here, a perfect love. He's talking about how it's perfected in a relationship with God. But then he goes on to talk about the day of judgment. Listen, we will stand in judgment of every word and listen to me, every thought you have while you was on this earth. Unless you've accepted Christ and he's cleaned the slate. Follow me? 
We belong to Him. We have that assurance. But there's a judgment day coming. People, people say, I don't care nothing about the Lord. Well, you will because you're going to stand in judgment for Him one day. I don't care if you're saved or lost. You're going to stand before Christ. The Christian will stand in judgment on how you lived your life while you were a Christian. That doesn't mean you're not going to heaven. You will. You'll get in. But you may not get the rewards that you should have got because you did nothing. Because he said some get there just as by fire. What does he mean? Because their works will burn up. They never done anything. Let me put it this way. They were lazy Christians. God wanted us to do something and we did nothing. He, he wants us as individuals to be his ambassadors in a world that's lost. We'll stand in judgment for that. That doesn't mean, like I said, you'll be in heaven. But he'll look at it and say, you know, you had an opportunity to do some stuff for me. And you didn't. I had a reward laid up for you. But I can't present it to you because you did nothing to deserve it. How about that? What's he saying? Look at the widespread sin. Look at the assurance he gave us. Even in that, he says... There is no fear in love. We don't have to fear the judgment if we're a child of God. We don't have to fear that because we have that love of God within us because we've accepted Him. We don't have to fear death because we're a child of God. Now, I know everybody says, oh, you know, I worry about... Yeah, everybody has a fright of dying. But he says we do not need to fear death. Why? Because we're in His presence when we die. We're, we're one of His children. That he's already paid the price for us. That we don't have to worry about the future because he holds the future for us. I'm telling you, this is, this is something we really want to think about it. As we're approaching nearly the end of the year. We need to look at it at the beginning of the year. How we need to take inventory of ourselves and see where do we stand before God. If not, we need to correct our stance and correct and move it forward in the right direction. God has a plan and purpose for each of us. And He wants us to fulfill that plan and purpose. But we can't do it doing nothing. He goes back to where the guy had the talents. The three talents. He gave one three, one two, and one one. The guy took those and invested and made more. But again, the other one just went out and buried his and did nothing. That's what He's telling us. God has gifted you in a way and He wants you to use it. For his glory and his honor. You have to decide on that. I don't know what your gift is. But somehow God has gifted you some way or another. And you want you to use it. it may only be to be able to pray. It may be the, the, like some of the workers in the church to put together those things. Here's what I want you to do though. This week I want you to identify somebody that's hard to love. And I want you to intentionally reflect some love on them. I know there's some people that's that only a mother could love. But find somebody that's really hard to love and reflect some of God's love on them. Okay? Let's depart. Father, thank you for this time together as we, as we look at our lesson today on love. That John, John talked so much about love, God, because he knew he was a disciple that loved Jesus and Jesus loved John. He wanted us to know the love of Christ that's in us and what God did for us. I send this son to die on a cross. As we come together in this, this time of year, where you sent that son here on earth to be, live and be among us, to know our hurts, our pains, our joy, our suffering, and yet loved us enough to sacrificially give your life that we might have eternal life. Go with each one of us now, Lord, as we depart from this place. Let our light so shine during this time of the year and any other time of the year, that people might know that we're a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen.